This Pet X Talk is brought to you by Natura Pets, Bound Animals, and Dogwise Publishing. Hi, I'm Dr. Jody. I'm a holistic veterinarian in the Midwest. I've been practicing on dogs and cats for about 30 years. I graduated as a conventional veterinarian and gradually over time opened my mind to become much more holistic. One of the most complicated areas that I like to teach my clients about, the pet parents working with their animals, is nutrition. Nutrition can be really complicated. And I have developed a great tool for you called the Nutritional Ladder. On the bottom of the rung of what I call the Nutritional Ladder is unbalanced scraps. Many years ago, our dogs and cats were fed a lot of table scraps. But table scraps were a lot different back then. So now, what are table scraps? Well, sometimes it's the Doritos and the pizza, and those obviously aren't very good things or certainly not a balanced diet to be feeding. Some people do feed cooked types, parts of their meal, and some people feed raw. I'd like to talk to you today about what's better and how we can look at all the different food options and move up this nutritional ladder. If you're feeding unbalanced table scraps, one of the main things that is probably deficient in that diet is the calcium. Because today, many pet parents are actually counseled to not feed bones. Well, certainly I agree with all other veterinarians that say you shouldn't feed cooked bones. When you cook bones, you actually change the molecular structure of the bone and you make it brittle. And that's what makes it dangerous. But think about the wild. The carnivores that are out in the wild eat little critters. They're eating prey, which is raw and has bones in it. And they need this calcium. The calcium phosphorus ratio is vitally important in a diet. And when you're eating a prey, it's naturally balanced. But when you're feeding this and that from off your table and as you're cooking and you throw scraps or you intentionally make an unbalanced home prepared diet, you're usually missing the adequate calcium, which means the phosphorus, which is in the meat, is in excess. And over time, this high level of phosphorus is actually very damaging to your pet's kidneys. And kidney disease is one of the most common old age diseases in our dogs and cats. The other problem with an unbalanced scrap type diet is often excessive starch. And starch is sugar, which can be very inflammatory and also contribute to obesity. And as you know, we have quite a diabetic epidemic in this country, and that is incurring in our pets as well. Processed home food contains preservatives, a lot of artificial preservatives. These can also be carcinogenic over time. And of course, a lot of human scrap food has dye in it, and dye can be carcinogenic as well. One out of two pets now are dying of cancer. So it's near and dear to my heart to tell you to try to avoid foods that contain artificial preservatives and dye. And some of the products that we eat and probably shouldn't either, contain rancid or hydrogenated or trans fats. And again, these are buzzwords for ingredients that can cause cancer. Perhaps one of the good things about some table scraps is that it might be the only way that your pet gets any amount of fresh food. So the next step up on the nutritional ladder is grocery store kibble. Ha ha, call that dog food? <clears throat> It was back in the days of the Depression when livestock feed was often the only food that dogs and cats could eat because no longer could those people afford to even give their pets table scraps because they needed every bit of food because they were starving. So they found out that the animals were willing to eat some of the livestock feed. And someone decided, let's put that livestock feed together, make it into little kibble bits, put it in a bag, put a dog or cat picture on it, and we'll call that dog and cat food. That is actually where that whole idea developed. That really isn't what a dog or cat or little carnivores are meant to eat. They're predators. They're meant to eat prey. They need to eat a little 
critter or mimicking that that contains four important body components. The flesh, the organs, the ground bone, and a little bit of fruit and vegetation like is in the stomach of a prey. But what happens when we start feeding these processed kibble diets that are all full of excessive starch? Again, <clears throat> this is inflammatory. So why do I say it's full of starch and how can you tell that? You can do some simple math. Look at the back of the bag of dry kibble that you might be feeding to your pet. They don't tell you the percent carbohydrate. Why not? Well, they don't have to. And if you saw how much carbohydrate, sugar, starch, same thing, is in there, you would be appalled. So add up the things that they do tell you. The protein, the fat, the fiber, the moisture. Those four main components. They don't add up to 100%. Subtract those four from 100, and that percentage is the sugar, the carbohydrate that's in that food. It's going to be approximately 30 to 60%, depending on the food that you choose. Additionally, the foods that are on this next step up on the ladder contain a lot of allergenic grains. For example, soy or wheat. Those are common allergens for our pets. They also all contain synthetic, synthetic vitamins and minerals. Why is that? Well, when you process a food, when you cook a food, you destroy a lot of the nutrients, the vitamins and minerals that are in that food. You decrease the amount that is in there and the body needs that. It's vitally important. So what the companies need to do is add back in vitamins and minerals. And so there are um, standard premixes of vitamins and minerals that these manufacturers can put in the food but they don't work in the body as well as getting your vitamins and minerals from a natural food source. Also because these big bags of economical, dry starchy kibble diets sit on manufacturer warehouse shelves for sometimes years and are shipped all over the country, they do need to have preservatives in them. However, they are commonly, on this rung of the ladder, going to be artificial preservatives. So sometimes if you look at the back of the bag of grocery store diets, you will see BHA, BHT, or even ethoxyquin. These are buzzwords for artificial preservatives that in some rat studies have been shown to be potentially carcinogenic. So again, cancer causing. And that is one thing we should all start getting our mindset attuned to is decreasing anything in the diet or in the lifestyle that could contribute to cancer in ourselves and in our dogs and cats. Also there's the dye. So it, you might think that it looks fabulous to see uh, kibble falling from the sky that has little green shapes and orange shapes in there to mimic peas and carrots, but those are artificial dyes that are put in that food. And sometimes you will actually see that listed on the back of the bag, for example, red dye 40, another buzzword for potential cancer. So the advantage to feeding foods on this rung of the ladder is that they're cheap. The middle rung of the ladder is what I would call the so-called premium foods or premium diets. There's actually no official definition for this. It's the manufacturers themselves that have dubbed their foods to be premium foods. Usually these foods are loosely veterinary affiliated companies. They market their foods through veterinary clinics. Sometimes they have dinners to educate the veterinarians about uh, the ingredients and the recommended uses of their diet. Again, they're kibble diets, dry kibble. So they're all excessive starch. And you can do that same little mathematical computation on the back of the bag uh, to determine how much starch or carbohydrate is in that food. Many of them also have allergenic grains, usually a little less so along the wheat and soy um, realm, but there's usually going to be corn or rice in those diets, and those aren't ideal for most of our carnivores. How many dogs and cats go outside and, and collect corn and rice and uh, turn it into a flour and then eat it up? That just doesn't, it's, to me, it's just not even common sense. Because these are processed, again, they need to contain the synthetic vitamins and minerals that we talked about earlier. Prescription diets may still contain artificial preservatives. Uh, some don't. Um, they are often restricted and actually not recommended to be safe long term. 
So prescription diets and these premium foods often go hand in hand. The prescription diets means that the veterinarians are recommending them for a specific disorder. And because they're restricted for that disorder, they will often have a deficiency that can develop over time. The good thing about those diets is they have recognized that the animals uh, are not seeing those vibrant colors and that the dye is put in there simply for us to think it's a good food, and so they don't put any dye in there, so that's great. The next step up the ladder is the so-called natural kibble. Again, there's actually no definition for natural either. Usually these are sold by the smaller natural pet retailer companies. Still a dry kibble, still full of excessive starch. They might be better grains. For example, millet. Millet is one of the more easier to digest diets. There is a natural diet uh, company out there that really focuses on using millet in their food. This same company avoids the synthetic vitamins and minerals in their food, which is great. Grain-free, that is a joke. It is a marketing trick and is very misleading. People believe that grain-free means that it's a totally meat-based diet. They simply replace the grains with potato or tapioca starch. And potato is in the nightshade family. Commonly, this is actually an allergen to a lot of dogs, and it's still certainly a form of starch. So again, do your math, even if it's a grain-free diet, and you will find that 30 to 60% range of starch in that food. So... <clears throat> Synthetic vitamins and minerals are added. Commonly with these foods, it'll say, all natural with added vitamins and minerals. That is because legally, those vitamins and minerals are not natural, so they have to point out that they've been added to the so-called natural food. There are no artificial preservatives in the natural kibble diets, so that's great. Also take special note with these diets of their packaging. You don't want to take uh, a great big bag of this type of natural kibble diet and dump it into a um, type of rubber container because these companies have really taken great strides to put their product in special packaging to keep it um, safe so that it uh, doesn't develop rancid fats in it uh, because they aren't putting any artificial preservatives in that food. All right, closer to the top of the ladder are the more meat-based diets, but these are going to be the canned diets or the ones that you're starting to see in the pet food aisle in the grocery store where there's a little refrigerator and you look in there and it looks like it might be a raw meat diet. It's meat sealed in a, a vacuum sealed plastic, but it's simply cooked meat. So it's not raw meat, so don't be misled in that way. Also, many of those are not as high meat filled as you would think, they actually often contain some type of starch like rice and that's what's going to help them lower the price on that product. So the canned diets do have more meat and less starch, so that's great, but they're still a processed diet. So it's still a cooked meat, it's still in a can. There's an NIH study, National Institute of Health, that shows that when you cook meat, when you process it, when you put it in a can, when you put it as a dry kibble in a bag, when you char it, when you grill it, the more cooked it is, the more heterocyclic amines are released from that food. And heterocyclic amines are mutagenic. That, again, can produce cancer. <clears throat> this is an NIH study, National Institute of Health. And in that uh, report, they discuss the cancers that can be caused by cooked meat in humans and in animals. This includes things like colon cancer, prostate cancer, breast cancer, pancreatic cancer. And our animals get all these things just like we do. I'm a vegetarian. I consider that I'm a primate. That's a species appropriate diet for me. For the little carnivores in nature, they are out there eating little critters, which are prey, which are raw. And to me, that's the ideal balanced type diet, and that's what we're striving for. So although canned diets are a great step up the ladder, and again, everything is relative, they still are a processed type of food. Because they're processed, those natural vitamins and minerals get cooked out of the food, so those foods on this rung of the ladder are also going to have those synthetic vitamins and minerals added, except in the case of one natural diet out there on the market that has been able to accomplish not having to put those in there. Remember that there can be toxins in the packaging of foods. So there is a study uh, that was published in cats 
where there was a correlation with the development of hyperthyroidism, which is very common in older cats, in more so in cats that were eating canned food. Uh, they put um, uh, plastic coating in the cans so that the cans don't rust. And it's important that that coating be BPA free. Um, you've heard the buzzword BPA when you're buying your plastic water bottles, that you want to try to avoid plastics that have BPA, BPA in them, simply because this was identified as one type of plastic toxin that's actually what we call an endocrine disruptor. So it messes up your endocrine or your hormonal system. So your thyroid gland is a hormonal gland, um, and in cats, the way their disorder manifests is with an overactive thyroid. So you see these old cats that are super skinny, but they're eating great, and there's a correlation with canned food with that. I often do recommend canned food as a stepping stone or a transition to getting them from a dry kibble diet onto a raw meat diet, which we'll be talking about in just a second. I'd also like to mention that a lot of canned foods contain a substance called carrageenan. This is a thickener, so manufacturers purchase it, put it in the food in order to make that nice, thick, gooey um, texture that a lot of cats love. But carrageenan is also often used in studies when they're intentionally trying to incite inflammatory bowel disease. And how many cats are vomiting and getting loose stool, uh, symptoms of inflammatory bowel, and maybe you don't even know it's because you're feeding a canned food that contains carrageenan and you're thinking that they're vomiting all the time because of hairballs. Very commonly, they are not vomiting due to hairballs, but actually a problem with their own food. Canned food is actually also a very expensive food. What I found is that you can move up from canned food to the top of the ladder and not have any more expense because canned food actually costs more than raw food. So at the top of that ladder is balanced, raw, commercial frozen, or maybe freeze dried, or home prepared if it's balanced. But the key here is balanced. Now there are ways that you can work with dietary formulators to determine this, but some common sense can be very helpful here as well. You just need to make sure that there are four components in your raw diet. The meat flesh component, the bone or an added calcium to make sure that it's balanced, Organs, don't forget organs. In nature, that's where our little carnivores get a lot of their vitamins and minerals from, is the organs, and we're missing that in most of the regular type uh, diets today. The fourth component that you want to make sure that you're putting in your home prepared raw diet, or that is included in a balanced commercial raw diet that you purchase, would be some blended fresh vegetation. The little prey, the little critters that our carnivores eat out in the wild um, have some warm blended vegetation in their stomach. Our carnivores cannot uh, break down the vegetation on their own. They don't chew like an herbivore. They don't have the same enzymes in their saliva. So we need to provide them with a warmed blended vegetation so that they can then assimilate that. There are some um, balanced, raw, commercial diets that do contain added synthetic vitamins, so watch for that. In some situations, you may want to go ahead and feed that type of a diet. In other situations, it might be important to you to avoid that, and so you need to look at those products. Don't assume that the commercial raw diets don't contain synthetics, because some of them do. Usually these raw diets are a great source of whole food vitamins, not the synthetics, the minerals, also enzymes, which are vitally important to digestion. They also usually contain probiotics, which are the good bacteria that are so important to our health, our immune system, and also some fatty acids, for example, the omega-3 fatty acids. Those diets contain those things, but all the foods on the, the rungs of the ladder below that do not contain those things. So if you do need to feed from one of the other rungs on the ladder, and you may need to, you may have a shelter of cats, um, you may foster a lot of dogs, um, maybe you have a Great Dane, a 
golden retriever and a Doberman pincher and you just can't afford to do all raw food for them. There are some ways that you can fill in the nutritional gaps even though you're feeding some of the processed foods that are lower on the ladder. You can make any diet better simply by adding some fresh food. There is a caution here though. If you're adding blended fruits and vegetables, that's fabulous. But if you're adding meat, remember, you can throw off that calcium phosphorus ratio. If you're adding simply meat, not, an, uh, not a balanced meat diet, but just the flesh meat, that is high in phosphorus. So you need to balance that with enough calcium. There's not enough calcium in the kibble to balance the phosphorus in the meat that you add. There's only enough in there to balance the meat that's already in that kibble. So you can add blended veggies or a whole food supplement. And there are many companies out there that are touting whole food supplements. You can also add enzymes. You should add probiotics and or prebiotics. Probiotics are like um, seeding your garden and they need to grow, they need to colonize the gut, but they need to feed on good things too. Um, chicory, chicory root is a great example, a source of inulin, which is a prebiotic that helps those good bacteria grow. And lastly, very important, is the omega-3 fatty acids. And in our carnivores, it makes sense that those would come from fish oil. Uh, cats don't have the enzyme system to break down and properly utilize omega-3 fatty acids from things like flax like we do. And so it makes sense to me that they would better utilize fish oil. When you're confused by all this, just kind of go back to nature and, and think, what makes sense in nature? Do the ingredients that are in this food make sense? Something that my dog or cat should eat. So lastly, variety is the spice of life. So I always say, no matter where you are on this nutritional ladder, if you're at the bottom, and you're a little college student, and all you can do is afford to feed your kitty um, a variety of grocery store dry kibble diets, then yes, I kind of put them in a crappy category, but if you feed a variety of those kinds of foods, you will find that your pet will do much better than if you keep repeating the same one over and over. You will unknowingly be repeating some excess or some deficiency over and over. There is no perfect food. So even if you're at the top of the ladder, those foods aren't perfect either, so feed a variety of those foods too. Different meat proteins within one company and different companies. If those vitamin and minerals have been added to the food, they're gonna be repeated the same from one meat version to another. So if you switch around with your companies, you will create a much stronger gut in your dog or your cat. Also keep in mind that there are dogs or cats that eat from the bottom of the ladder day after day, year after year, and they still live a really good, long, full life. Maybe they were blessed with fabulous genes, which is very helpful, and maybe you have provided them with a fabulous lifestyle. Those kinds of things can totally make up for inadequacies in the type of food that you're feeding. We're here with Dr. Jody after her wonderful PEDX talk, The Nutritional Ladder. Dr. Jody, I want to follow up by asking how I, as a pet parent, would know where my food is falling on that ladder. So we touched a little on that during the presentation, but to get more specific, there are many more things that you could learn about reading the ingredient label on the foods. And so um, the order, for example, that the ingredients are, are on the label will also help place you on there. So it's important to learn a few more things about how to read what's on the bag and how to not be misled. I also want to ask you about filling the gap. What are some of the alternatives that we can look for? So I touched a little bit on some of the things that need to be filled in, for example, the probiotics and the enzymes, but there are some areas that can be difficult. There are a lot of good natural 
uh, pet retail products that are being developed. But I found in my veterinary practice that, for example, uh, there wasn't any product out there that was a good variety of organs. Uh, you can buy liver treats, but I felt that I actually needed to figure out how to fill that gap for my patients. So I developed a product, I call it Entrail Mix, and it even contains um, pork brain and lamb liver and spleen. There's a little gizzard in there so that we really can provide our predators with all the components that they would find in a prey. I also was finding that to solve a lot of allergy problems, I needed to recommend a raw rabbit diet, but there wasn't any exclusive rabbit treat. So I decided to develop Delectable's Rabbit Snack. And in terms of finding the information, that's always a challenge for everybody. And I know even you've expressed that. Where do you go to and, and what's a great way for us to get more information if we want to dive deeper? Well, hopefully I've done a little bit of that work for you. I've done a lot of research on my own and um, accumulated a lot of information from my 30 years of experience of being a holistic veterinarian and put it all together in a book. It's called Live With Your Pet In Mind. It's available on Amazon. And I really tried in there to pull together not only the components that I spoke with uh, the audience about on the nutritional ladder, but also the idea of positive thinking, how damaging negative thinking can be to your pet, that the whole lifestyle environment is just as important as the food that you're putting in the pet's bowl. Well, thank you so much for everything you're doing in the pet world. It really makes a difference, and we appreciate it. Thanks, Robert. Funding for PetX Talks is provided by Nature of Pets. Nature of Pets can help you optimize your pet's health with premium organic supplements from the Amazon and Andes Mountains. Visit natureofpets.com. Dogwise Publishing, all things dog. For all of your expert dog book needs, visit dogwise.com. Bound Animals, working towards big ideas that advance the safety and happiness of animals in our homes, our shelters, and everywhere in between. Visit foundanimals.org. This has been a Pet World Media Group production.